Amen. So tonight we're continuing in our uh, Up From Slavery sermon series. And what we've been doing is we've been going through biblical lessons in the book Up From Slavery, which is the autobiography of Booker T. Washington. Um, as I've said before in the introduction to the series, the reason that I like the book so much is because here we have a man who had um, seemingly no advantages in his life. He had no advantages. He had everything um, working against him. He had everything um, from, you know, he started out from zero as far as money goes. He started out from zero as far as education goes. He started out, I mean, the man couldn't write, he couldn't read, he couldn't do anything. And, you know, all he had was the determination um, to, to, to succeed. So we've been talking about that a little bit for the first few sermons. But this morning, we're, or not this morning, this evening, we're not going to spend a lot of time um, in the book this evening, but um, I want to show you one uh, disadvantage that I had not thought of when, before I read um, the book itself. There's a disadvantage um, that Mr. Washington points out on page 18, which is going to be the subject. It's, I'm just going to use it to kind of spark um, the sermon this evening, but it's a, a disadvantage that he had that, I, that you wouldn't really think of unless he would have brought it up in context of his life. I'm going to read it for you, um, starting at the top of page 18 in Up From Slavery. Keep your place in Zephaniah chapter 3. We'll get there in a few minutes. He, um, he writes in the book, I have no idea, as I have stated elsewhere, who my grandmother was. I have or have had uncles and aunts and cousins, but I have no knowledge as to where most of them are. My case will illustrate that that of hundreds of thousands of black people in every part of the country. The very fact that the white boy is conscious that if he fails in life, he will disgrace the whole family record, extending back through many generations, is of tremendous value in helping him to resist temptations. The fact that the individual has behind and surrounding him proud family history and connection serves as a stimulus to help him to overcome obstacles when he is striving for success. So here, um, Mr. Washington brings up, you know, we obviously can see the, the material things that he, he, he was disadvantaged with, the educational things he was disadvantaged with. Here he brings up a, a super important point, and the Bible talks about it a lot, is that he was dis and he uses it in the context of, you know, the former slaves had broken families. They didn't have, you know, these long lineages of families that were, were kept together because of the situation in um, the South and in um, the slave during the slave times. So he tells us that that is a disadvantage that these families are broken up and that there isn't this long lineage of families in the context that. It is a lack of shame that is put on um, the individual that does not have that family to go back on. Meaning, you know, if you don't succeed or you do the wrong thing, you will disgrace or put shame upon your family. He lacked that motivation. And he said that that was a great, it was great value in deterring from temptation which is, you know, what we could call, what the Bible would call, sin. Look at Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse number 5. So what he's talking about is the idea of broken families versus intact families. You know, this idea that you want to make your parents proud. This idea that you want to do, you know, your family name right. You know, that you want to make it not ashamed as the Bible would say, you know, your family. So what I want to talk about this evening, the title of the sermon this evening, is the power of shame. The power of shame. Look, what do we know about shame? What is the world telling us about shame today? The world is actually telling us that shame is bad. That you should not feel guilty about anything. You should not have shame. That there is nothing that's shameful. Well, what does the Bible say? And... Booker T. Washington himself said in the book that we're studying, he said, look, this is a powerful tool. It's of great value to keep someone from temptation, is this idea of shame. Look at Zephaniah chapter 3 and look at verse number 5. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, the just Lord, the just Lord is in the midst thereof. The just Lord meaning the Lord of justice, the Lord of perfect 
justice. If you're just, that means that you're righteous. That's what it means. The Lord is in the midst thereof. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth He bring His judgment to light. He faileth not. But the unjust knoweth no shame. Ouch! Think about that. Think about that statement. Highlight that statement in your Bible because the, the world today is telling you that you should not feel guilt about things. Well, look at that this evening. You shouldn't feel guilty. You know, guilt is something that was put upon you. Well, look on, on that. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you know no shame, you're unjust. If you know no shame. Shame is gone today. Shame is going away today. And the Bible, look, the Bible lists specific things that we should be ashamed of. Shame is a powerful thing. Is it a good thing? Let's look at it. Turn to Isaiah chapter 47. Let's look at some things that we should be ashamed of in the Bible. Look, we should be ashamed of all sin in the Bible. We're going to look at one main sin this evening as an example just to show you on how you should be ashamed of sin, but you should be ashamed of all sin in the Bible. And the world today is telling you that you should not be ashamed of sin. Look at Isaiah chapter 47 and verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 47 and verse number 1. Booker T. Washington himself said that the idea of shame in the context of shaming your family is a valuable thing. Is a valuable thing that he did not have. Look at, he looked at it, he looked at the idea of, think about this. He looked at the idea of him not having that, you know, not being able to be ashamed because he did something where his parents were ashamed of him, or his grandparents, or his uncles and aunts, where he shamed the family name. He looked at that as a disadvantage in life, and he was right. He was right. Look at Isaiah chapter 47 and verse number 1. Let's look at an idea of something that the Bible is very specific and talks a lot about what, how we should be ashamed of this one specific thing. Look at Isaiah 47.1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Make, you know, make... Make note that it says make bare the leg and it says uncover the thigh. Meaning the thigh is, and then look at verse number 3, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. The Bible here is defining your nakedness like is your thigh is your nakedness. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame. You see what it's doing here? It is equa equating your nakedness, which it defines as your thigh. It's very specific. The Bible is very specific. It's defining your nakedness, which is your thigh in this case, as your shame. As a shameful thing. If it's uncovered. So your, your thigh to be uncovered, your nakedness, which is the same thing, is a shame. It's a shame. Look, the Bible here is saying that this is going to be like a judgment. It's like you're going to be shamed because of this. Thy shame shall be seen. If people shall see that nakedness, that is, that is a shame to you. I will take vengeance. I will not meet thee as a man. So it defines nakedness. It says that someone seeing that nakedness should be shameful. Turn to Genesis chapter 9. We'll see a specific story in the Bible where someone looking upon nakedness of someone else is, is a terrible shame. Look at Genesis chapter 9 and look at verse 22. Now look, a lot of people have different theories about this story. Okay, and I'm not... Uh, negating those theories. I'm going to tell you my theory about this story. And if you've heard um, other theories about this story, that's fine. Um, I personally like to just go with what the Bible says and not, you know, um, you know fill in gaps and, and things there. I'm not, you know, against other theories, but I'm just saying that I think the Bible is very clear and says enough for us to understand what's happening here, especially in the context of what we're going to talk about this evening, what we're talking about now. Look at Genesis chapter 9. In verse 22, And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Noah uh, drank alcohol from wine that he made, and he got drunk, 
and he, he got drunk and he was, he was naked inside his tent because he drank too much and he was, you know, you know drinking is not going to do any favors for you. All right, that's another, you know, just a side note of this story right here. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness. So Ham is the son of Noah. He saw the nakedness of his father. Now, what does it say that he did there? There's a verb there that he did. It says he saw his father's nakedness. He looked upon it. And he told his two brethren without. And look at verse 23. And Shem and Japheth took a garment. These are the other two brothers. They took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards that they what? What was the bad thing? That they saw not their father's nakedness. Here you have a situation where one of the sons went in and saw his father in a, in a bad situation where he was not covered as he should have been because he had too much to drink and he was being foolish and drank too much alcohol. And he went and he looked upon his father's nakedness and then he went and he told his brothers what he had done. Look, this shows you the seriousness of nakedness and of looking upon the nakedness of someone that you're not supposed to. Right. Look, that, and, and, and you think, you know, so I understand, I understand why, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, he must have done something, but look, I don't believe so personally. Right. Because this just shows you how programmed we've been today. Right. Today, you know, nakedness, I mean, whatever, no big deal, everybody's naked. But in the Bible, it was a big deal. Right. And to God, it is a big deal. It is shameful right. in the Bible. And so look, Noah awoke from his wine, verse 24, and knew what his younger son had done to him. As a matter of fact, you know, what else he did was he didn't have respect for his father by doing that. Right. And you say, okay, you know, what's the big deal there? All kids are disrespectful to their parents now. Turn to Romans 1. Amen. Turn to Romans 1. Yeah. Turn to Romans 1. Look, that's another thing we need to deprogram ourselves about. We need to deprogram ourselves about the seriousness of being disrespectful to your parents. It's a big deal. Look, it's such a big deal, folks. It is such a big deal when you look at Romans 1 and you look at verse number 30 when it's talking about people that have literally been given over to a rejected or reprobate mind. Unnatural, wicked people. You know what? One of the, one of the, the, the ways that it describes them, look at verse 30. Backbiters, haters of God. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. Look, it's a big deal. What Ham did, like in my opinion, nothing needs to be added to that story because what he did by looking upon his father, like by shaming his father, by looking upon his father's nakedness in that, in that bad moment that his father was in, notice, how, notice what they did. Notice what they did when they fixed the situation. They walked in backwards and covered him so they would not look upon him. Right. Which was the problem, is that he looked upon his father's nakedness. He did not protect his father. He disrespected his father, and he looked upon his shame. Right. And look, just because we've been deprogrammed today to be like, you know, it's no big deal. It's no, look, it's a big deal to God. God does not change. No matter how many, you know, how, how many different fashion trends and how long you've been seeing different fashion trends, God doesn't change. It doesn't matter. You change. We change. But God does not change. It was a big deal. 2 Timothy chapter 3, talking about perilous times in the end. It'll talk about all these wicked people and they're not going you know, to listen to sound doctrine and all this. You know what else they're going to be? Disobedient to parents disrespectful to their parents. It's a big deal. Your nakedness, being disrespectful to your parents. Look, Ham did a bad thing that it's just listed straight in the Bible. There's no gaps that need to be filled in, in my opinion. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 10. Going back to the shame of nakedness. The shame of nakedness. Look, it doesn't matter you know, what you think. This is what the Bible says. 2 Samuel chapter 10. Because look, this is a big problem today. This is a big problem. Look, this is a big problem for us today. You say, well, I dress appropriately, but tell me that you're not used to it. Tell me that you're not getting used to it with what you're seeing out in the world today. And look, it's, it affects people. 
It affects people. 2 Samuel chapter 10. Look at verse number 4. Let's look at how big of a deal nakedness is. How shameful nakedness is. Look at verse number 4. Wherefore, Hanan took David's servants and shaved off. So David sent these men to go and, and make peace and see how the neighbors are doing. And this guy thought they were spies, and here's what he did to them. And Hanan took David's servants and shaved off one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. <laughs> that's funny. He cut off all their clothes and shaved their beards. You know, and that's a good cartoon, right? I mean, that's a funny Sunday school story. Right, but look, it wasn't funny. It wasn't funny in the Bible. I mean, we may think, oh, that's kind of a silly thing that he did there. Well, I mean, let's see if David thought that it was silly. Let's see if David got these guys, they came back, and he's like, oh, <laughs> you guy, he got you, didn't he? He got you, didn't he? Look at verse 5. And when they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly, what? Ashamed. And the king said, tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob, the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and King Mecca, 1,000 men, of Ishtop, 12,000 men. Why? Why did he do that? Why did he go hire all these people? Because when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. So look, this was such a big deal that David was going to war over this. It was such a shameful thing that... that Men are going to die over this. David is going to go to war and defeat these people over this shame. So look, Noah cursed Ham over this shame. David went to war over this shame. Look, having your nakedness uncovered should be a shame to you. It should be a powerful thing to you. Turn to Exodus chapter 28. Look, this is the power of shame. And this is one of the main sins in the Bible that the Bible says that, you know, is just, just equated straight to shame. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 28 and verse 42. Exodus chapter 28 and look at verse 42. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs shall they reach. Once again, defining our nakedness being from our loins, you know, above our waist, down to our, you know, our thighs are our nakedness. Meaning, from your knees to your belly button, basically, is your nakedness. Now, imagine that. That your, your knee to above your waist is your nakedness. And just think of today. Just think of today. I mean, there are people literally walking around naked everywhere today by this definition. I mean, nakedness from actual dress standards to what people set in front of their eyes on a regular basis is out of control today. Look, we must deprogram ourselves from what we have been programmed to think is no big deal. Our, I mean, look, our society is literally to a point where if you said, I'm just never going to see nakedness, you could not leave your house. That is where it is at today. That is where it is at today. Because, because, because why? Because there's no shame today. Because shame has been taken away from that today. This is what Washington is talking about. Shame is a good thing. We need to put shame back on that today. We need to recognize, at least us, Bible-believing Christians, need to recognize what is shameful and what is not. And we need to deprogram ourselves from what the world is trying to program us into. But look, you should, you should not be purposely putting nakedness in front of your eyes. And we've talked about this, from going to beaches to the Internet. I mean, don't even get me started on the Internet. The last time I looked, like two-thirds of men are like regularly looking at pornography on the internet. That's a big deal. It's shameful. It's shameful. Just like Ham, you are looking upon somebody else's nakedness. It's a shameful thing. Look, you sh it should be a shame to look on the nakedness of someone who's not your spouse. This, I mean, this is why I personally, I avoid trips to Walmart whenever possible. And I'm serious. My wife's like, well, I gotta go to Walmart. I'm like, have fun. 
you know? Look, it's shocking. It's disgusting what people are wearing today. People have no shame about their nakedness today. They just don't care. I mean, they leave, I mean, they leave the house dressed or barely dressed, I mean, like a hobo, some of these people. Cover your nakedness. And look, here's the thing. It, it matters. You know, here's just a side note, too. On the Walmart issue, it matters how you look. I mean, this idea that it just doesn't matter how I look. I mean, where are people getting this? I mean, talk about things. I mean, you look like a slob. People will treat you like a slob. Do you know that? Take some pride in your appearance. I mean, take care of yourself. I mean, I'm not saying be vain. That's the other end of the spectrum. But, I mean... The other end of that spectrum, other than the other end of the vanity spectrum, is just zero shame in anything. And that's what's going on today. I mean, my wife was telling me about this. I mean, this can only happen in America. My wife is telling me about this body positive movement. Who's heard of this? Have you, raise your hand if you've heard about this. We're basically like, you know, it's body positive. So basically, I mean, this, this only happens in America. This can only be an American thing. Where basically you have a bunch of, you know, you know, obese, diabetic Americans who are like, oh, you know, you don't have to be in any kind of shape because it's all good. There's no shame in anything. Like, that's not good. Only in America. People can literally celebrate unhealthiness in this country. But look, it's anything, it's really anything to divert the blame off yourself is what it is. But look, Back to the point, cover your nakedness. Don't dress in a shameful way. Take care of yourself. You know, what else? I mean, all sorts of things could have, you know, should have shame on them. All sorts of other sins. But back to, you know, back to what Washington was alluding to. You know, your life just in general, your life, he's talking about temptations, your life should not be a shameful one, folks. You know, your parents, your family, your relatives, should, you know, people that love you and know you shouldn't look at you and, you know, just be like, oh, you're living in, in, in drunkenness, you're living in fornication, you know, you're not making anything of your life. Look, there should be shame attached to the, all of that. But all of these things, whether it be nakedness or drunkenness or fornication, I mean, especially those things, they've all become normal today. They've all become things that are not shameful today because look if you're living in fornication there's you know and and your parents are looking at that there's really two ways you can you can deal with that as a parent you can say you know what i gotta you can either look at that and say well my son's living in fornication and i'm a terrible parent because i've raised a son to live in terrible sin like that that's one way or you can just say you know what we're going to remove all shame from that and we're going to just decide that that's okay we're going to decide that there's no shame anymore. And that's where the world's going today. That's where the world's going today. Look, it's all about living a guilt-free life today. Let me give you a quote from a website called lifeasahuman.com. I mean, how many people think this is a website you should be on, just from the, the, uh, the, the title there? Look, some people, look, this is, there's a whole new movement today designed to get everyone to release all feelings of guilt of anything. From lifeasahuman.com. Some people hold on to guilt feelings, believing that the amount of guilt that they have represents their level of thoughtfulness and caring. That assumption could not be farther from the truth. Think about it this way. Would you want someone you love and care about to suffer guilt feelings over something he may or may not have done to you? Yes. <laughs> That's my answer to that. But look, okay, I added that. Guilt is self-punishment, the website says. Our friends and loved ones would never want us to inflict that kind of pain on ourselves. First of all, is guilt self-punishment? Is that what guilt is? Turn to Romans chapter 2. Where does guilt come from? I mean, where does guilt come from? Look at Romans chapter 2. Look, psychology today, the whole study, the whole field of psychology today would tell you that guilt is ingrained in you through, you know, your parents pushing dogma on you or, you know, some religious beliefs that were pushed on you and, and forced on you in an oppressive upbringing. That's what the world will tell you. That's what psychology today will tell you. Or by, you know, belief in, in a book like the Bible. That just forces you into a bunch of guilt. That's what, that's what the entire field of psychology thinks today. 
That guilt is something that has been pushed into you by a, a belief system that your parents or somebody that raised you put you into. But is that true? Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Here's a bunch of people that didn't have the Bible. They didn't go to church. They didn't do anything. And they did the things in the law. And more than that, look at verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Look, the Bible, or the Bible here is saying that people that had never been to church, people that had never read the Bible, they're going to accuse themselves. They're going to feel guilty about things. And what that's going to do is it's going to push them it's going to push them into certain types of behavior. Uh, look, someone who's never been to church, someone who's never even opened the Bible one time in their life will feel shame. Will feel guilt. And as a matter of fact, they have to be trained by stupid websites like lifeasahuman.com to not feel guilt and to not feel shame. It makes me think like, it makes me think that people don't think their positions through. Because what does the psychologist today do with that? What does he do with the fact that somebody who's never opened the Bible, never had a religious upbringing, never had any of that, feels shame and feels guilt? What do you do with that? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? They, they don't think, people, people don't think their, 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 their positions through. That's the problem. If they, if they did, they would realize that the Bible has the only answer that is an infinite answer. That you can't dead end. That you can't dead end the answer. Look, you have to be trained to not feel guilt. You have to be trained to not feel shame. Shame is a good thing. And it's the fact, you know, Washington was talking about the fact that people without strong families, they lacked this. They lacked shame, and it was a disadvantage, he said. And he knew it. So look, folks, preserve your shame. Preserve your shame. Don't, and you know how you do that? Don't expose yourself to sin. If you expose yourself to sin, whether it be through TV or all these subtle methods or whatever you're watching on the internet, it's like you are going to, you're going to sear your conscience, you're going to, you're going to scar your shame. You're going to take away your shame. It'll desensitize you. And you will lose that. Look, shame, shame is a warning system for you. Shame is an alarm system for you. When you get too close to something, when you get too involved in something, you feel shame. You feel guilt. Look, and, and the better you are at preserving your conscience and not searing that thing, the better this alarm system is going to work for you. The more you're in the Bible, the better this alarm system is going to work for you. You're going to get exposed to something and you're going to go, whoa! You're going to feel guilty, you're going to feel shame. That's where you need to be because then it'll keep you, as Washington said, from temptation. It'll keep you from that. It's a good thing. It's a good thing because guess what? No one wants to feel ashamed. No one wants to feel ashamed. A better, you know, a better question for psychologists today would be this. Why not just not care if you feel ashamed? Right? I mean, instead, they try to get you to, to you know, not feel shame towards things and not feel shame about sin, whether it be, you know, whatever kind of sin there is. They say, you know, you don't need to, they, they try to deprogram that out of you, but if it's no big deal and it's not real and it's not a bad thing, why not just say, why just, just not care? Because here's the thing. It's a natural thing to not want to feel ashamed. It's a natural thing. And it doesn't work. It's like trying to defy gravity. But guess what does work? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Guess what does work? They know it doesn't work. They know it doesn't work to tell somebody, oh, you know, you're going to feel ashamed for all this, but, you know, don't worry, shame is okay. You know, I mean, look, here's the thing. Here's what they can do, though. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 1. They can sear the conscience. 
2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience. This is uh, Romans chapter 2, 14 and 15. This is that law written in your heart. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Scarred, folks. What happens to a scar? Or a callus? You know what? You know what happens to it? You know what happens when you get a, when you get a scarred part? I have a scarred part on my knee, on, on the outside of one of my knees. And I used to, I, I did something to it. I hit it really hard on, on some piece of equipment when I was a kid. And like, it's, it, it scarred my knee. And like, I just can't feel anything right there. And I used to like, as a kid in high school and stuff, I used to take like a pin and like put it into my knee and be like, look at this, you know, show all my friends. I could stick a pin in my knee, you know, and it was like the funniest thing ever, right? But it was scarred, it was seared, I couldn't feel anything. That's what a scar will do. It's just, it's a disgusting, you know, example, I know. <laughs> Not in the notes. All right, stick to the notes, Jared. All right, but I mean, I used to sit there with a pin. Look at this, guys, at wrestling practice and just stick a pin through my knee. You know, they're like, ah! That's awesome, you know? Look, you can do that to your conscience. That's no good. Okay, you can do that. You can sear your literal conscience to where something that comes in front of you that normally, you know, that alarm system would go off, it's, it's, it's scarred and it doesn't do anything. Imagine that. It's not good. Christians can do that. Look, just because you're saved, you're not protected from this. You can still sear your conscience. It's, it's dangerous. It damages. Look, this is why you'll see people that are 30, 40 years old, and they're damaged human beings. Because their conscience is just seared in certain areas. They just don't care. They just don't care. They just like, they don't care how they treat people. They don't care what they would do to somebody or whatever. I mean, look, you can sear your conscience, folks. There should be shame in all these sins. Laziness, drunkenness, I mean, whatever. Look at, I mean, this is why, this is why the, drunkenness is a shameful thing. Did you know that? This is why the drunk always wants company. This is why the drunk gets mad when other people don't want to drink with him. Because look, they want company. They don't want to be ashamed all by themselves. They want validation, so they're not ashamed. Like, look at us all. We're all a bunch of drunks. That's how the drunk wants to feel. Because that takes away or makes it less hurtful to him, his shame in what he's doing. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Here's the last point on, on shame. Shame's a good thing. Shame's a good thing. Booker T. Washington was pointing out, he's like, you know what? It's like, we don't have as much shame as the white people do at, at this time in history because of their families that are intact. He's like, that's a disadvantage to us. He's like, shame's a good thing. But here's what you don't want. You don't want people to be ashamed of you. When people are ashamed of you, that's not good. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, look at verse 26. Look what the Bible says here. It says, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me, this is Jesus. He's saying, these are red words right here if you have a red letter Bible. Jesus is saying, look, if you're ashamed of me, if you're ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Look, if he, Jesus is saying, if you're ashamed of me, he's like, I'm going to be ashamed of you. That's right. That's right. It's like, talk about the kind of shame you really don't want coming down on you. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. So while shame's a good thing, it'll deter you from sin. We should always protect ourselves and protect our conscience so we always feel shame. Look at Romans chapter 10 and look at verse number 11. Look what the Bible says. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is a very well-known verse for if you're a soul winner. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Look, you don't want Jesus to be ashamed of you. And everybody, I guarantee you, you know what? You don't want to be ashamed of Jesus because otherwise you're eventually going to be ashamed. You know, we come to a lot of doors of people who are ashamed of Jesus. They're ashamed of Jesus. They don't want to talk about religion. They're ashamed. I mean, you want to bring up 
religion to some people. And look, it, this, is, this is the man today. That, you know, you come up to some guy on the street with a Bible and he's just like, he's ashamed of the Bible. He's ashamed of the Bible. You know, the big tough guy today, you know, this is what liberal Christianity has done. It's, it's painted this picture of the Christian being some wuss or something like this. Where you can't be, you can't be a hard-working, you know, man that's supporting his family and walk around carrying a Bible. The two are incompatible. No, the two are exactly compatible. But the problem is, is that, you know, liberal Christianity today has literally made people ashamed of the Word of God. People are ashamed. People, oh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk religion. How many people do you know like this? It's a, it's a shameful, look, those people are going to be ashamed one day. Because Jesus Christ is going to be ashamed of them. Look, it's a big deal. Shame is something that is a great tool that should drive us in our lives. We should not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we should be ashamed of everything that is sinful in the world. Don't, look, we've got, we have got to deprogram ourselves. Even, you say, even us, even us. Even us. You know, because you know what? Especially California, it, w with the whole nakedness thing, it, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Look, we've got to have standards. We've got to have standards if we want the next generation to have any chance at all. We've got to draw some lines. And you know what? Those lines are going to be lines that, other, that nobody else draws. Because otherwise, you know, we're going to be ashamed with the way that our children turn out. We must follow the lines of the Bible. This is, I mean, I hate to say the same thing every sermon, but I mean, that's, that's what it is. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how used to things you get. Y you, you must deprogram yourself to this idea that nothing is shameful. Because just about everything that we see out in the world today is shameful. Especially this idea of nakedness. Shame is a good thing. Don't let it get programmed out of you. Even a man like Booker T. Washington that is so brilliant that he recognized this as a disadvantage. How did he recognize this? How did he recognize this? Do you ever, do you ever wonder when you're reading this book, by the way, how did he know all this stuff? The guy had no education. How do you know all this stuff? I mean, don't you just find wisdom coming, just popping out at every page at you in this book? You know how he knew all this stuff? You know, in the first few pages, you know what he start, started learning to read? The Bible. Amen. That's how he knew all this stuff. Because he, he studied and he learned the Bible. And that's where he got this as well. And look what it did for him. Look what it did for him in his life. Shame is a good thing. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for...